Hallelujah. Yes, we will rise. What a wonderful and glorious inheritance we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. We have a great future. A home in heaven, a home in the new heavens, and a new earth for all eternity. It's a hope that outshines every shadow that we experience in this life. It's great to be back today. We were out last week, went to Georgia to visit my mom. I had a good visit with her and with relatives. Got to see a new great niece um, while we were there. And that was um, very, very good. Took a little side trip and enjoyed some of South Georgia. We went to the Little Grand Canyon. I don't know if you knew there was a Little Grand Canyon in Georgia. It's got a whole story behind it. But that was pretty neat. And um, got to do some good things together. So we enjoyed our time away. And of course, we're very thankful for Brad Crawford coming in and speaking last week, sharing a message from... Uh, First Kings, and for you all being here and supporting the church and being the church each and every week. It is good to be here today. Today I have a title of the message, Misplaced Identity, the Root of Cultural Compromise. Misplaced Identity, the Root of Multiple of Cultural Compromise, and that will be uh, coming from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Now, misplaced identity means that you're finding your identity in the wrong place. You're looking in the wrong place to see who you are, but not just who you are as an individual, but who we are as the body of Christ. And today we're going to see that emphasis in 1 Peter chapter 2. As an individual and as a people, we can compromise. And we can be compromised as we identify and follow the culture. We see this happening over and over again with the nation of Israel. It's a lesson for us. Today is the body of Christ to be faithful to Christ. We adopt values and, and lifestyles and priorities of the culture that are in conflict with those of the kingdom of God because we identify with the culture. We can even come become complicit with a culture as it lives and acts at at odds with God's righteousness and and justice in the world. So it can be a very dangerous thing. In 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, we read, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a people for His possession." So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Father, I pray, God, that you'll open our hearts and our minds to your word, that we will understand that who we are. As the people of God. And Lord God, you'll help us, Lord God, to identify with you and your kingdom and your purposes, Lord, above all other loyalties, identities, and understanding. God, may we put you first in all that we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This message is a part of my series called R21C, which is a new reformation. I said that we need a reformation, not just individual reform, but as the body of Christ. It's kind of calling for revival. It's calling for us to to get back to the center of what God's called us to do. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get off course. We find ourselves going in many different ways. But God's called us to unity together in Christ and in the mission of Christ. And we need to go there. And I talked about being together, united in the mission, the ministry, and growing to maturity in Christ, as we found in Ephesians chapter 4. I talked about three things that cause the the church to veer off track. These are detours. These are things that divert us from what God has called us to. The first is fleshly fixations, which I talked about last week. Week or two weeks ago in Romans chapter 6, and how the flesh has a, 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 a hold on us, but we have died to the flesh and we can live free in Christ. 
Second is cultural compromise, which we'll look at today. And the third is divisive dogma. Three things that I think have divided and gotten the church off track at many times. And we always are placed to evaluate and move back to what God's called us to. Under the fleshly fixations, two weeks ago I had the message, live free. And that freedom meant live free from the bondage and slavery to the flesh, to sin, to the fleshly nature, and live free in Christ as a slave, as a possession, as a follower, as a servant of our holy God. The passage in Romans 6 reads, But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. Fleshly fixations can get us off track, even as a body, the church. Today we're looking at cultural compromise, misplaced identity. That means finding your identity in the wrong place. Even the church, even Christians together can find our identity in the wrong place. It doesn't mean we deny our identity as Christians, but we can begin trending towards other identities which can have, which can have a strong impact on how we view the world and how we prioritize and live out our lives. Identity. There are two basic elements of, of a person's identity. and One is self-image and the other is self-worth. Self-image is, is how we see ourselves, and there's an internal aspect and an external aspect to our self-image. The self-image from the, self from the internal has to do with our, our feelings, how we imagine or picture ourselves in our own minds, based on what we feel, what we think, what we believe, what our desires are, our aspirations what we see is our accomplishments, and we build an a image of ourselves. This can be positive or negative. It can be um, hopeful, or it can be despair. It can lead us to strength. It can lead us to, to um, depression and anxiety. So we have these images of ourselves that are within our own understanding and imaginations. There's also self-image that comes externally. And that's how we view ourselves in relationship to others. It could be to a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a, a parent, a, a child, a co-worker, a boss. It could be relationships to our family, to, to, um, to our peer group, to our culture, our ethnicity, the group we're in. Different, different ways that we understand who we are based on our relationships to People outside of ourselves and groups outside of ourselves. So these help to shape our identity. But those factors and those forces that help to create our identity can keep us from really understanding our identity in Christ. Because you see, your identity can be rooted in the flesh rather than the spirit. Our identity can be rooted in our ethnicity, in our culture, in our country, rather than in the kingdom of God. And we can get off base. Self-worth is about, what is my value? Do I have value? Do I have worth? Who am I? What am I? What am I worth? Am I any good? Am I significant? And, and in our culture, we, we crave significance. And one of the things that makes us significant in culture is the value that other people place upon us. And we sense that others value us, we think we have value. We sense that others don't value us, we think we don't have value. This can even happen to the church. The church thinks the culture approves us and likes us, that we can think we have value. If the culture rejects us, then we don't have value. So it's very important to understand where our worth comes from. And one of the most important things that you will learn in the Christian life is that our identity is in Christ. And our worth is in Christ. And your identity is precious. Precious as a child of God, one who's been redeemed, who's been loved, who's been raised again to new life in Christ. Who has a value that's beyond the value of anything in this world. 
For your child of God, a son, a daughter of God, who will last for eternity when all the things of value in this world are gone. You will remain as God's child, as God's chosen one in Christ. We have great value in Him. Misplaced identity. In 2 Corinthians 6.14 it says, Do not be yoked together with those who do not believe. That means don't be joined together with unbelievers as individuals, as the church. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? When we partner with unbelievers, it doesn't mean you can't love unbelievers, work with unbelievers, be, be neighbors with unbelievers. We obviously want to Love, care, share, encourage all people. He's talking about this partnership, this identity, this connection that belongs to God alone and to our place in the body of Christ. In John 18, 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world, but as it is, my kingdom is is not from here. Now that was a hard thing for the disciples and the people of Israel to embrace. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for a nation to be established on the earth in Israel at that time by the Messiah. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from here. And Jesus is establishing a kingdom, but that earthly kingdom doesn't come until he returns the second time. Right now, he's calling together the citizens of that kingdom. And he's casting out the net. He's making the call through us, through the word, through the gospel, to the ends of the earth to come. To come to God, to be a part of the people of God, the nation of God, the church of Jesus Christ, and, and be a part of that eternal kingdom, our identity. Our passage we're highlighting today in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says, but you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy Nation, a people for his possession. He's talking to the church. He's saying, This is your identity, church of Jesus Christ. And of course, this text comes straight from Exodus 19, when God called Israel out of Egypt and said to them, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people for his possession. You see, God's created a people. And it began with Abraham. And Abraham, and through Abraham, the nation of Israel came Christ. And out of Christ, all the peoples of the world can be grafted and brought into that nation, that people, by being in Christ, in relationship with with Christ, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You see that? That's a new identity. They come from different backgrounds, different language groups, different ethnicities, different parts of the world. And he says, now you are God's people. That's our identity. Our identity, but all other identities and loyalties, the people of God, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says, you are a chosen race. Now we think of race in terms of black and white and, and that sort of thing. For them, race had to do with 
with, um, with a family ancestry and heritage of a large group of people. You know, we think of the black race, but in Africa there are actually multiple ethnic groups or people groups that are very large there that aren't from the exact same ancestry just because they have dark skin. Same thing in Europe. There are many people with light skin who come from different backgrounds, different people groups, different ancestries. So says you're a chosen race, so that means we have a common ancestry. And what is that common ancestry? It's Jesus. You see that? See, I was born into the world to my mother and father who had a particular ancestry. But when I was born again, I was born into a new ancestry. The ancestry of Jesus. The ancestry of our Father in heaven. So we have this new identity, this new heritage. And when you look back, you can see Jesus. You can see the Father. You can see what God has been doing. And you have been birthed into that family. The family of God. And that is our eternal ancestry. In 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter begins the letter with these words. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He said he calls them. He says, you're exiles. You're exiles. We could read it like this today. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those chosen living as exiles Exiles dispersed abroad in Central Florida, Tampa, Jacksonville, and Miami. We could read it like this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in the United States of America. He said they were exiles. Do you know what an exile is? It's a people without a land. It's a people without a, a physical homeland. They're living in another land. Peter says you're living in another land. This is not your homeland. One day, when we rise again, we will enter into our homeland. Our homeland forever. He says, you are a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, As you come to him, a living stone, that is Jesus, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God. You yourselves, the church, the body of Christ, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built into a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're a holy priesthood. Now priests are those who serve God. And we are here to serve God. Priests also intercede on behalf of others and, and pray for others to bring them to God. And we've been given that ministry of reconciliation to pray for, to share with, and to bring others to God and to the forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ. We have a holy calling as the priesthood of God here on earth, serving God and bringing others to forgiveness and redemption through Jesus Christ. That's our identity a chosen race, an ancestry from Jesus, a, a royal priesthood here to serve the King of Kings. He also says, you are a holy nation. Again, he's speaking to the church. And he says to the church, you are a holy nation. Remember, they're exiles living in a foreign land. 
but they're a nation. They're a people. Being a Christian isn't just individual. It's also national. But it's not the United States. It's not Canada. It's not England. It's the kingdom of God. He says the church is a holy nation. He says we are a holy nation. Just as he called Israel a holy nation, he calls the church a holy nation. And of course the church is the people of God and, and we are grafted into the true Israel of God. And all who are in Christ, part of the true Israel of God, are the nation of God. He says, you are a holy nation. This is the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the king. He's the king of our nation. God only established one theocracy in history, and that was Israel. And we know that it failed. It failed due to fleshly fixations. It failed due to cultural compromise with the nations of the world. It fell due to the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. Now the Bible tells us that it will be restored. And the return of Christ there will be a, a restoration of Israel. But God has created no other Christian nation. He says the church, the church is that nation. That holy nation. When Peter refers to the holy nation, he's referring to the church of Jesus Christ. The church is a nation, it has a king, it has laws, but it does not have a land. 1 Peter 1, 1 he says, To those chosen, living as exiles. One of the ways the church has gone off track throughout history is through the attempts to establish a Christian nation ruled by people. And it leads to cultural compromise. This began with Constantine when he declared the Roman Empire a Christian nation. He co-opted the church. And the church was compromised. It continued throughout the kingdoms, the nations, and the papacy of Europe as every nation and king would claim that they were the Christian nation, the Christian king, the Christian ruler, and then they would fight wars with one another. They would persecute other believers, other Christians. And they believed that they could create a Christian nation. Even John Calvin believed that he created, he created a Christian city in Geneva. The Christians who didn't agree with the dogma were even executed in the Christian city. Christians who translated the Bible from Latin into English were burned at the stake for translating the Bible from Latin into English. Why? Because the state ruled. The state determined what was right and wrong. The state could imprison and execute for false teaching according to the state. And it has continued on. It was carried over into America in the American colonies with the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is in the area of Massachusetts and Connecticut. This colony was started by the Massachusetts Bay Company in 1628 and was governed by the Puritans. And the Puritans had been in England and they were persecuted. They were persecuted because the official church of the Christian nation of England was the Anglican church. And the king was the head of the church. And they persecuted the Puritans for not being faithful to the Anglican church. And they wanted freedom. They wanted freedom to worship. And they came to America and they started a new theocracy. A Puritan theocracy. And who was persecuted there? The Anglicans, the Quakers, the Baptists. Baptists fled from Massachusetts and started Rhode Island to have 
freedom of religion. That's what happens when the church and the state try to come together as one. We are called to be the salt and the light. The church is called to be the people of God wherever we are in every nation and to bring righteousness and goodness and justice and, and blessings wherever we are. Even God told the people of Israel to pray for the welfare, the good, the welfare of Babylon. Seek the welfare of your nation. So we're called to bless. We're called to be an example. We're called to stand for righteousness and justice. But we must remember that our nation is the kingdom of God. The state can't be Christian. They think, what are you talking about? I was raised, you were raised, that we are a Christian nation. Now you have to define what that means, a Christian nation. But when I read the scripture, a Christian is somebody who repents of their sins, places their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, and follows Him. The state doesn't do that. The state does not repent of its sins, places faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, and follow Christ, engage in the mission of Jesus Christ to make disciples of all the nations. That's not the role of the state. Now we want the state to have godly values. We want the state to have righteousness and justice. We want Christians to be actively engaged in our country at every level, every level to bring goodness and righteousness into the world. But when we join state and church together, what happens is the church co-ops the state. And the state gets, I mean the state co-ops the church, because the state has the power. And the state gets moral authority and legitimacy because it identifies itself with the church or with any other religious group. And then what the state does is what the church does, is what Christ does. But that's not what Peter's talking about here. He says you're exiles. You're a holy nation. You're a chosen people. Living here in this world because Jesus called us and placed us here to be his people in America, in the United States, and in every country on the, on the planet. We're to be his, his people, his holy people. Believers are to live holy lives. If you read through 1 Peter, Peter talks about how we are to live our lives in the world. To be an example of, of goodness. He says, don't be persecuted for doing evil, but if you're persecuted for doing what is good, that's okay. He says, be a light. He says, let the world see your goodness and we can... Show that goodness when we are pure and holy and set apart as the people of God, uncompromised by culture. He says you are a people for his possession. And you're God's possession, God's treasure, God's special possession. As it's described in the Old Testament, and, and we see here in 1 Peter, this is a, is, a, is a marvelous identity, it's a marvelous thing. It, it, it means that, that you, we, the body of Christ, are something special to God. A special treasure, a special possession that belongs to Him. And that's where we get our value from. That's where we get our worth from. Is that we're God's special treasure. God's special people. Not because of anything in us. But because of God's grace and favor. And that's why it's the good news. It's the good news because anyone can be a part of the people of God. Anyone can be a part of this holy nation that God is building. Today. It's good news. It's good news for us. It's good news for the world. You are a people for his possession. 
In 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope. New birth. You see, it begins with that new birth we talked about earlier. We this new birth into a living hope. So in the darkest of days, the saddest of nights, whenever that might be, whatever's happening, I have this living hope because I've been saved, I've been redeemed, we've been saved, we've been redeemed. He's the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, as Sean and them sang about just a few minutes ago. Into what? Into an inheritance. You see, we're part of the family of God. And God has an inheritance for His children. For his family, into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. We have a lot of anxiety about the future, a lot of anxiety about how we're going to make it through the next month, the next year, through retirement, through all those things. And Peter says, You're the people of God. Your chosen race. You're his possession. And you, as a child of God, of the family of God, the people of God, the children of God, you have an inheritance that no one can take away, that can never be lost, that is yours forever. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is our identity. This is our identity. Our image is the image that we have as the children of God in Christ. So we have this new identity in Jesus Christ. If you want to know who you are, know who you are in Christ. And that's the, the greatest identity you can have. No matter what anyone thinks of you, nobody can change who you are in Jesus Christ. No matter what thoughts or conflicts you might have in your mind or in your emotions, those thoughts, those conflicts can't take your identity in Christ away from you. Because it is a gift of grace from God to you. And it is yours forever. This is who you are. This is who we are. And my own thoughts or the world's thoughts don't determine my identity anymore. God determined it. When God chose me and God saved me and God called me to be born again into His family, I received a new permanent, glorious identity in Jesus Christ and our value. Our value is unsurpassed. You and we are a treasure. Why? Because we belong to God. And God loves you. And God loves me. God loves us. And that gives us great value, great worth. Jesus gave his life on the cross to save you, to bring you into his family. If you're watching today and you've never received Christ and you're struggling today about who you are and what you're worth and what you've done and how you failed or how things might not be working out in your life, know this. God loves you. And God wants to redeem you and save you and give you this identity and this value that is unsurpassed by anything you can experience, accomplish, or receive in this world. Our identity is that we're God's people. I'm not just a Christian as an individual, but I'm a part of the people of God, that chosen race, the holy nation, the royal priesthood, the special possession, the people of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for His possession. Can you embrace that today? Can you say we are a chosen race? 
That's not something out of superiority because he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. God would that none would perish, but all would receive eternal life. We're part of this chosen race because we're chosen in Christ, because Christ was chosen. We're chosen in Him. We are a royal priesthood. Can you embrace that? We're a royal priesthood. You're part of a royal priesthood. You're here to serve God and to intercede and to help others to come and to know the forgiveness and the redemption that is in Christ. Can you receive the word that we, the body of Christ, is a holy nation set apart by God, a people of God, a people for His possession, a special treasure. Embrace that today. Repeat it today. Memorize that today. And say, this is who we are as the people of God. Why? So that we may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a great, great gospel. We have a glorious message. We have nothing to be ashamed of no matter what anyone thinks or says. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That's good. You see, our identity delivers us from guilt, from shame, from um, all the negativity that we can experience in this life. He says, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. You have not received, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so we're called to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. We'll close with this. He says, as obedient children, we're the children of God, the children of the Father, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. That's the fleshly fixations. Those are the worldly desires from within and temptations from without. He says, do not be conformed, do not be molded, do not be compromised by those things. He says, but as the one that is God who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. So the call of us, because of our identity, we are to live holy lives. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, our identity, our being, leads to our doing. It's because we understand who we are, that we live the lives that we live as holy, set apart for Christ. When we have a misplaced identity, this leads to a misunderstanding of who we are, and it leads to compromise. And we compromise in order to be affirmed and confirmed by others, or to fulfill the deceptive desires of the flesh. So we must understand who we are, that we are holy and set apart by God to do what? To live holy lives. And that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to live holy lives. Why is that? Because we're the exiles who have been placed on the planet to be a royal priesthood. To be a light that shines in the darkness. To be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. To show the glorious magnificence of God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. And when the church is compromised by the flesh or by the culture, people will say, look, the church is unholy, the church is evil, the church has sinned. And they'll use it to attack the church. But when we as the church live in our identity in Christ as, as holy people set apart to God, doing good and showing the goodness, the righteousness, the justice of God to the world, for. It'll see love. It'll see peace. It'll see righteousness. It'll see loyalty. It'll see forgiveness and redemption. It'll see purity and, and, and loveliness. Because it'll
you'll see a people who reflect the glory of Christ. Now what I've shared with you today should give you and give us an absolute sense of security. That we have no need to compromise. We have no need to fear. We have no need to seek fleshly means to fulfill the will of God because we are secure in Christ. We've been saved. We've been born again. We have an inheritance. We have a calling. And we are a holy, holy people. So let's be that people together. A lot of times it's our fears, it's our anxieties, and it's our misplaced identity that makes us fight with one another and doubt one another and argue with one another and, and, and strive with one another. But when we're delivered from that, we can be free. Free to be the people, the children of God. Let's be that people today. Let's stand together and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the mercy, God, that you have given to us. Lord, for the forgiveness, the freedom, the righteousness, the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask you, we ask you today to convict us, Lord, of where we've compromised. And allow us, God, the grace to repent, to turn, to change, to be holy. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness and your cleansing, and we receive it in Jesus' name. And Father, as you've forgiven us, Lord, we commit ourselves to forgive others. Father, in holiness, extend the grace of Jesus Christ to the world. Help us, Lord God, to live as holy people, to do good for others, to show them, God, your goodness. Show them, Lord, your righteousness, your love, your peace, your justice. Lord, pray, God, for an awakening. Pray, God, for revival. Pray, God, for a move your Holy Spirit among us. God, we can rise up in power through your Holy Spirit to be who you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing a song at this time. We're going to pass it on to Jill Saber here on the, on the slides. And this doesn't mean that you're not saved. Of course, we're not saved. We want you to call on the Lord and be saved. But saying, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing. God, I want to be a part of where your spirit is moving. God, I want to be a part. We want to be a part, God. Help us, Lord God, to receive it, to walk in it, to enjoy it, to live it, God. That we can be a part of what you are doing today.